As is clear from Tolkien's own comments, the Gothic was, in effect, an alternative to classical civilization. And in this, he is echoing the work of earlier 16th and 17th century antiquarian historians. The Goths were barely mentioned throughout the Middle Ages, the medieval period. But by the Renaissance, Italian painters and architects began to denounce as Gothic everything not built in the Roman style. That included Neolithic standing stones and stone circles, as well as Romanesque and Norman churches and medieval cathedrals. It had the result of encouraging a wider interest in Gothic itself. So some 16th century antiquarians followed the Gothic historian Giordanes in arguing that the Goths not only originated in the north, but were the purest northern race and exemplified robust and hardy northern values. These historians suggested that the Goths displayed an instinctive love of liberty and that it was this that had enabled them to overcome the tyranny of the oppressive and decadent Roman Empire. And further examples of the Gothic championing of history and of freedom were evident in English history, it was thought. And so the Gothic spirit was identified with great moments in the progress of the nation where the people had demonstrated their Gothic roots by rebelling against imposed, especially foreign, authority. So the presentation of Magna Carta, which is the constitutional rights of the people, was seen as a challenge to Norman oppression, to the Norman conquest imposed after 1066, and was seen as a central instance of Gothic liberty being expressed in England. By the 17th century then, the Gothic in England had developed into a theory of politics and history. It was anti-classical and anti-absolutist. In other words, it was anti-despotic power. One consequence of this growing emphasis is that later political debate in the 16th and 17th centuries was rooted in studies of the past. Not only did this research seek to establish where these ancient tribes had gone, what were the origins of racial identity, and what were the foundations of national character, but they also focused on key historical events, such as the crowning of William I or William the Bastard in 1066, to assess whether the Norman invasion of England had really been a conquest or simply a way of replacing one Saxon ruler with another. These theories of what was called Gothic polity were developed by the parliamentarians, those who believed in parliaments over the authority of the king, in arguing against the attempts of Stuart kings such as Charles I to take more and more power. So Gothic polity, the government of the Goths, was thought to be constitutional monarchy and a feudal land management. It was seen as a government of free men. And it was a system of government, these historians suggested, that was shared by all of the northern nations, as well as by Poland, Hungary, and parts of Spain and Portugal. So this idea then formed the core of 18th century liberal thinking, and this is called the Whig Party, um, who held that Parliament and the people, democratic will of the people, had power over the king or the monarch. And it was also a way of endorsing, of supporting their own values of commerce and trade. In contrast to that, and returning to the values of the Renaissance, were the royalist party, the Tories, uh, the aristocrats, who favoured classical taste and attacked the Goths as barbaric, crude, destructive, obscure, and dark. So you have two different attitudes of the past here. And the Tory, the royalist enthusiasm for classical literature and architecture, is seen perhaps most notably in the Duke of Buckingham's London House, uh, built in 1705, 
which was acquired by the King George III in 1761 and is now known as Buckingham Palace. So a strong anti-Gothic narrative in which the Goths are seen as degenerate was being put forward by the royalist Tories at the same time as a pro-positive Gothic model was being advocated by the liberal Whigs. There's also a third strand to this thinking. The determined revival of classical culture in 18th century England was seen as neoclassical um, and as a response to the political Gothicism um, of the Middle Ages. It's what we would today call medievalism. There was a revival in this um, interest and um, taste for, uh, for the Middle Ages. And this movement interest, uh, influenced architecture, literature, drama, as well as social behaviour. Medieval cathedrals and castles inspired not only whole new building projects in the form of picturesque ruins um, in the gardens of aristocratic houses, but also interior decoration, furniture, and the gardens themselves. Gardening was seen as Gothic. And in fact, you can argue that the Gothic really begins in the, in the garden. Estates began to allow little wild patches to grow, untended by the gardener. They were free from the tyranny um, of that um, gardening um, aesthetic and were therefore seen as being symbolic of the spirit of liberty. The weeds were liberal, they were natural, they were growing up. And it also ties the Gothic um, to ideas of natural wilderness. Um, indoors, um, you could buy Gothic tables, chairs and bedsteads. Um, and the, I think the height of this um, trend um, is Strawberry Hill. There's a vast, rambling, um, mock medieval mansion built in, uh, on the edge of London by Horace Walpole, youngest son of the Whig Prime Minister Robert Walpole. Work commenced in 1748. In literature and criticism, there was fresh interest in early English writers from Geoffrey Chaucer um, to Edmund Spencer and writers like Richard Hurd outlined the significance of medieval romance and especially the virtues of chivalry for contemporary conduct and masculine behaviour in his letters on chivalry and romance. So all of this, um, the English Middle Ages, is seen as offering a model for a respectable life in 18th century England. Not everybody agreed. The literature was attacked, for example, by John Newbery, who said in 1762 that all this was absurd and unmeaning tales of giant champions, enchanted knights, witches, goblins, and other such monstrous fictions and reveries as could only proceed from the grossest ignorance or a distempered brain. Now, despite the savagely disparaging tone, this is a clear agenda for what the Gothic is all about. It's anti-enlightenment, it's anti-rational. It's a revival of medieval romance. And for us here at this conference, Newbury also really summarises what Tolkien will be doing years later. Giants, champions, enchanted knights, witches and goblins. It's only really dragons and elves and hobbits that aren't included in this list. And it's in spite of this, in spite of this attack, Horace Walpole of Strawberry Hill published two years later what's considered to be the first Gothic novel, The Castle of Otranto, 1764. The Tranto has all the features we've come to associate with Gothic novels. It's set in an ancient castle riddled with secret passages. It's haunted by old prophecies. There are bizarre supernatural events and uh, the place is populated by the walking dead. A lot of this is taken from Elizabethan and Jacobean drama such as Shakespeare's Hamlet. And if Otranto and the Gothic literary genre can be said to have influenced Tolkien, there seems to be plenty of evidence here. Middle Earth is littered with ancient and ruined architecture. There are many subterranean episodes in passages under the Misty Mountains, in Moria, in the Paths of the Dead. There's prophecies in Isildur's Bane, for example, that motivates the Council of Elrond, the Lord of the Nazgul appears to be protected by a foretelling that he shall not be slain by any man. 
The dead walk in the shape of ring wraiths, barrow whites, and oath breakers. And there's a strong influence, I think, from Elizabethan and Jacobean drama as well. Notably Hamlet. The play Hamlet is characterised by northern doom. It's not a classical tragedy. And it's infused by dreams of self-doubt. And Tolkien was also influenced by Macbeth. Among other scenes and images provided... Um, the inspiration for the March of the Ents. If anybody's read Macbeth, they'll recognise that Tolkien's using that. Tolkien admitted as such. But it's only in the manifestation of supernatural events that Tolkien's stories fall short of the bizarre um, and extreme incidents that pepper Otranto. A giant helmet uh, appears right at the beginning of the novel that crushes uh, the little prince Conrad. Now, if Walpole's excesses can be excused, it was that he claimed that his new supernatural medievalism was itself inspired by dreams he had while living in his own castle. And Tolkien's work too, especially The Lord of the Rings, and narratives such as The Lost Road and The Notion Club Papers, are pervaded by meaningful dreams. For Walpole... This was his attempt to evoke the sublime, as is defined by Edmund Burke in his Philosophical Inquiry, published in 1757. Now, this theory best expresses, I think, the impulse behind the Gothic passions. For Burke, for Edmund Burke, the sublime experience was typified by the experience of terror and immense power, and this is heightened by obscurity. Obscurity allows the mind to engage with the infinite. It gives a sense of the limitations of the mind. So Burke writes, But an immense mountain covered with a shining green turf is nothing in this respect to one dark and gloomy. The cloudy sky is more grand than the blue, and night more solemn and sublime than the day. And drawing on examples from English literature, Burke famously quoted John Milton, his description of death, in Paradise Lost, with which some of you may be familiar. Now, I'll read this out because I think you can see very, very clear connections, I think, now with, with, with Tolkien. This is death. The other shape, if shape it might be called, that shape had none distinguishable in member, joint, or limb, or substance, might be called that shadow, seemed. For each seemed either. Black it stood as night, fierce as ten furies, terrible as hell, and shook a dreadful dart. What seemed his head the likest of a kingly crown had on. Now, the manifestation of death in Paradise Lost has a real sort of horrid palpability, which is immediately recognisable to the reader of Tolkien. The Lord of the Rings is a book full of shadows, from the pitiless gloom of Moria, above them all as they lay hung in the darkness, hollow and immense, to the suffocating blackness of Shelob's lair, from a knife in the dark to the coming of the great darkness, from the dreadful arrival of the ring wraiths, so black were they that they seemed like black holes in the deep shade behind them, and the confrontation between Gandalf and the Lord of the Nazgul, a great black shape grown to a vast menace of despair. The witch king himself is like a, a compound of shadows and nothingness, very like Milton's account of death. In fact, the wish king says, this is my hour, do you not know death when you see it? It's worth noting in passing that other Miltonic imagery also seeps into Tolkien's work. Milton's lurid depiction of sin, for instance. Sin is this female um, whose womb holds hellhounds, uh, lies, I think, behind this rather abject um, description of the female monster Shelob. She served none but herself, drinking the blood of elves and men, bloated and grown fat with endless brooding on her feasts, weaving webs of shadow. For all living things were her food and her vomit darkness. Far and wide her lesser broods, bastards of the miserable mates, her own offspring that she slew. Likewise, Milton's account of the building of pandemonium, the diabolical city, and the devil's invention of explosives and guns is reminiscent of the industrial um, 
model of Isaac.